In this chapter, we're going to take a look at capital structure, but now we're going to incorporate what theorists and researchers refer to as market imperfections. And the first one we're going to add for this uh, chapter is debt and taxes. So let's talk about how taxes influence the financing decision. <clears throat> so in a previous video, we talked about the value of a company um, in a world that has perfect capital markets. So this particular graph reflects the, the end result, I guess, of the conclusion of that chapter. Where you look on the horizontal axis here, we have 100% debt or 0% equity. And on the far right, we have 0% equity and 100% debt. So what this represents, it says, it really doesn't matter what your capital structure is. Choose your financing mix wherever you want it, because no matter what you do, you will not be influencing the value of the company. So therefore, under the market, uh, perfect capital market um, hypothesis, value is not impacted by financial decisions. Now, what about taxes, though? Once we incorporate taxes, we know that corporations obviously pay them, and taxes are, or interest is a before-tax deduction. So interest expense reduces taxes, so that creates an incentive to use debt. When we talk about an incentive to use debt, what does that mean? Essentially, what we're talking about is there is a benefit to being able to deduct things from taxes or from our income to reduce the tax burden of the investor. So here we have a company that has 2.8 billion in taxes or uh, earnings before interest and in taxes. They have interest expense possibly of 400 million and their marginal corporate tax rate was 35%. So how would this impact net income? Of course, if you look across here, net income is lower, obviously, with leverage because you have interest expense. But without leverage, again, that's the highest amount because, again, there is no interest expense. But look at how much is paid out in taxes. There's an actual $140 million less in taxes paid if we borrowed money. Now, again, it's just $140 million in less in taxes. We still had to pay the $400 million. But the idea of this, if you kind of can think of this, is the government is kind of subsidizing our borrowing. We have to actually pay $400, but the government is giving us back $140 million. So that is what we ultimately are going to talk about in a few moments when we talk about a tax shield. So again, just kind of reviewing, right? The total amount payable to investors was the same, right? But the uh, but it was uh, with higher leverage, right? There was uh, the, the total amount available to all investors was higher when we had leverage than when we didn't. Again, remember, you think of the bottom line, 1560 is what the equity shareholders get, and we paid 400 to the debt holders, so $1,960 was actually paid to all of our investors. <clears throat> so without leverage, we we're able to pay out $1,820. With leverage, $1,960. And again, as I mentioned earlier, where does that difference come from? Where does the $140 million come from with respect to borrowing money for the company? And again, this is our definition here of what's referred to as an interest tax shield. It's the reduction in taxes because of tax deductibility. So in this case, the formula, you take the tax rate times the interest payments. So again, if we have here the tax rate for this company was 34 or 35 million, 400 million was the interest we paid. So in the end, our interest tax shield is 140 million. So if you look at the total cash flows to investors, 
It was the amount that went without leverage plus that $140 million. <clears throat> so while we're thinking about this then, since we've recognized that there is a tax shield, the question then is what happens over time as, as tax rates change, right? So as you look here, suppose we have this income, the marginal corporate tax rate is 35%. What is the amount of tax yield in these years? So the difference, again, the tax rate is the same, but interest expense is different. So how does this affect the ultimate value then of the company? What is the value of the tax yield? Well, here's the interest expense. If you multiply that by 35%, that's the tax yield. So if you look at this every single year of this asset's life, the interest tax yield gave them additional $84 million to pay out to investors over this time frame. So when a company uses debt, this tax shield provides a benefit. Every dollar that the company borrows provides a benefit. So the cash flows that a levered firm pays to investors is going to be higher than it would be without leverage by that amount of that tax shield. So how can we rewrite this in Medigliani and Miller terms? The value of a levered company equals the value of an unlevered company plus the present value of the tax shield. So let's take a look at another example here. So we have a company, they pay $100 million in interest for 10 years, and then they're going to repay the loan of $2 billion. The payments are risk-free, marginal tax rates 35%, and the risk-free rates 5%. So how much does this tax yield increase the value of this company? Well, in the case of this, this tax yield, 35% times 100 million, right? So we know that that's 35 million a year, but we're going to get that for 10 years. So we need to find the present value of an annuity. And here's the formula for that. You can also use the time value of money formula. But if you plug those numbers in, the final, um, the present value of this interest tax yield is $270 million. Now we don't care about the repayment of the principal because the payment of the principal is not tax deductible. So what do we change our thought process just for a second? And now let's think about debt. Some debt is seasonal, but some debt is permanent. Right? There's some foundation of debt that we're going to maintain probably for the life of the corporation. So if a company borrows some debt and they keep the debt permanently, the marginal tax rate is T sub C here. And if the debt is riskless, the interest rates are sub F, then the interest tax yield each year is the tax rate right, times the interest of the tax times the amount of the debt. And if we do some algebra here, you can see that the present value of the interest tax yield is just the value, the tax, uh, uh, the corporate tax rate times D, which is the amount of debt of the company. So now we have a formula for the value of the tax, the present value of the tax yield. So now that we need to incorporate this, right, we need to put this into play with respect to our weighted average cost of capital. We now need a formula, obviously. So we have, here's the weighted average cost of capital, right, times one minus, again, this is T divided by C. We can expand this so that we can see the pre-tax weighted average cost of capital. And then we can subtract from that the reduction because of the interest tax yield. So again, 
weighted average cost of capital is expected to decrease because of this present value of the tax yield. If the weighted average cost of capital is decreasing, what do you think will happen ultimately then to the value of the company? And again, if we expand this formula, make it a little bit neater, you can see that this is in the this is the reduction in cost of financing. So let's look real quick at this graph, and we've seen this graph before. But in this case, what we find is since we're talking about a world with corporate taxes, we've just said that the weighted average cost of capital is going to decline, and it declines here in this straight line mechanism. So what is ultimately going to happen to the weighted average, or excuse me, the, um, the weighted average cost of capital is going to decline. So as we borrow more and more money, what ultimately is going to be happening to the value of our company? So if, again, coming back to this formula we had earlier, if the denominator is decreasing, the value is increasing. So what this would imply is maybe we need to borrow a substantial amount of funds. So let's see if we can use this in an application phase, right? So we expect to have free cash flow of 4.25 million. It's expected to grow at 4% per year every year. The equity cost of capital is 10. Debt cost of capital is 6. We pay a corporate tax rate of 35%, and we have a 50-50 debt equity ratio. So what is the value of the interest tax yield? So the pre-tax weighted average cost of capital, again, just multiplying the weights of our equity times the return on equity or cost, likewise for debt, 8.67, is the pre is the pre-tax weighted average cost of capital so the value the unlevered value of this company if you take the 4.25 million which is our free cash flow divided by the difference of the um, the uh, weighted average cost of capital minus the risk-free rate this company is worth 91 million dollars unlevered but what is the weighted average cost of capital with taxes? The, the weighted average cost of capital drops from 8.67 to 7.97. So now what is the value of the company? The value of the levered company is 107 million. So 107 million minus the 91 million means that the tax yield for this particular company is $16 million. So we've shown and talked a little bit about the math and how definitely we're seeing a benefit, but what does this mean with respect to the manager's decision to borrow money or not borrow money? If we come back to our graph, here is the graph, V sub L equals uh, v sub u in a world with no taxes in a world with taxes as we borrow more and more money we're going to find for every dollar we borrow there's a change in benefit it increases so this theory this concept right the uh, the value of a company when we assume that corporate taxes exist implies that we should maximize the amount of debt in the company. We should have 100% debt in our capital structure. Of course, we can't have 100%, but in general, 99% debt, 1% equity is what we should be shooting for to maximize the value of the company. So again, there are more videos coming our way to talk about this particular concept and this particular imperfection.